It's right Excellent. Up here. Um, Thanks, guys. So, I mean, you know, as Steven was saying, probably the most disrupted industry. I think, you know, when we're looking at the media world, music went first, you know, uh, and it's been a very painful transition from analog to, to digital. Um, but just to start off uh, on a consumer side, how do you guys personally consume music? I'm all in on Spotify personally, but Chris, do you want to start off? How do you consume music? I would say Spotify is probably the the most frequently used of the streaming applications, but I really do try to get as analog as I can when I can and listen to records in my house by myself. So you buy crying. vinyl, you do not buy CDs? Correct. Okay, Jimmy. Um, yeah, I'm a big Spotify, uh, a, a big Spotify fan, um, but I still think it has you know, a long way to go and there's a lot of limitations attached to uh, having everything at your hands uh, at one time. Um, so I listen to digital music through Spotify, but I also have uh, a nice uh, Macintosh stereo that I play vinyl through, which is a completely okay. different experience. But no CDs are being bought in I, you your know, household. I, I have a garage <laughs> full of CDs, and I'm waiting for the CD to come back so then I can sell them all. Okay, Adrian, <laughs> do you buy music? Uh, I buy records for the, the cover art and for the status of it and to the cool factor. Uh, but I rarely listen to them anymore, unfortunately. I'm trying to get that back. But you know, I listen to music like everybody else these days in a very fragmented way. You know, one-to-one -one just streaming you. You barely know who you're listening to anymore. Uh, there's no real cohesion. And that's one thing that, you know, I, I've been trying to tackle as well, is how do we bring back, you know, the, you know, the, the intimacy and the personal relationship to music beyond yeah. just the music. So I want to talk about the sort of three big areas. One is discovery, one is experience, and one is making money. Um, so. Explain to me Rec Room and sort of how you guys address each of those three areas. Uh, well, well, there's no better curator than uh, people who love music, you know, the, the, the people who are passionate about music and those th that are the creators. So uh, with Rec Room, we're looking to bring sort of a mentorship program where uh, artists can mentor other artists and tastemakers can mentor and curate uh, you know, the music that they love for others and really bring in a community of people back together so that we, we get out of the digital and relegate digital to, to the tools that they're, they're supposed to be that help mu musicians uh, get out there and help them market themselves but don't become the thing itself. Bring it back into the physical world so that artists and people can start to commingle again and we can experience music in three dimensions. Is this like a modernized label? Uh, no, I mean, I don't think so. I think we, you know, we would be sort of the, um, the grassroots uh, level of creating and uh, you know, innovating and, and creation and, until the labels would, would do their part, which I think are now becoming more of sort of events and marketing. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, you talked about uh, you mentioned Spotify, and you talked a little bit about discovery being a little bit broken. Is that the sort of big opportunity? Because we're, we're sort of swimming in too much of everything That's nowadays. Right. Yeah, I think, um, I think the next wave is going to be who can curate a great experience that's really relevant to the individual. I think, you know, where I come from in the 90s, um, you know, alternative rock was a cultural movement where you knew where to go to get the product. You went to MTV uh, to learn how to assimilate into the culture. You went to a radio station. Most of the stuff they, they came out was decent, uh, part of the culture. Now there's just so much of, of, of so much that it's really hard to, even for me, who's a, a, a rabid music fan, uh, uh, an ideal consumer, somebody who would willingly spend money on music. But when I go on Spotify, I just don't know what to play. I'm just like, I'm lost in a, in a sea of everything. So the person, and, and to, to, to his point, um, I rely on my musicians, for, musician friends to curate an experience for me. I have reliable sources out there that you know, will email me, hey, you got to check this out, mm -hmm. so-and-so's in this band, here's somebody's new project, and that's really uh, the only reliable way I have right now uh, to have a So how does Live One um, address the experience part? Yeah, so, so Live One uh, deals with the live side of it. Um, you know, we work with uh, companies like Chris's, Pitchfork, and we provide a social ecosystem around live stream video that allows people to communicate 
uh, in an analog way, much like they would in the physical space. We try to look what pe at what people do in a room and replicate it digitally because I know as a content creator that you know, although it's the content that's important, it's the environment that makes the content. It, it gives it the legitimacy. It creates an environment in which the content can be successful. That's why you see Pitchfork, Lollapalooza, ACL selling out before any bands are announced. It's those experiences in that environment that people are really buying into. Yeah, Chris, I was at a session yesterday in, um, where Jim Bankoff and uh, Henry uh, Blodgett from Business Insider were talking, and they were sort of pushing this idea that it was a golden age of journalism. I wasn't mm -hmm. totally buying what they were selling. Is it a golden age of music? Uh, golden age of music in the sense that there's more music being made maybe than ever before that's at least available. And to kind of what these guys are hitting at, at the same time, it's, uh, it's a very confused age in the sense that people truly have no idea what they're doing. You know, the analogy of the... the people like consumers. Consumers, okay. you know, like, like there's more art being made than ever because of the ease with which it can be created. But at the same time, as a, as a consumer or a listener or a lover of music in every way, shape, or form, whether it be the most kind of like avid all the way down to the most casual, there's still not a lot of help out there for them to find their way. So it's, you know, in, you know knowing what Jim probably discussed and, and what those guys, how they approach it, I think that people are going more and more away from what Jimmy was explaining about having friends that can recommend music and mm -hmm. the discussion and the romantic side of that. And, that's where the golden age of media and the golden age of music, especially for people like us, kind of comes into play because we live alongside it where we can help contextualize, help you discover, just essentially be there. So if you go to a restaurant, we can suggest what you might order in that, exam in that analogy. So mm -hmm. uh, golden age is probably putting it a little romantically, but I do think that there's, it's an exciting time for us to help figure out how to help people discover music. Yeah, so Adrian, it's also kind of a terrifying time, right? Because it's, it's never been harder to make money as an artist. Fair? Uh, <clears throat> well, that depends, yeah. It's, it's difficult, but I think now it's been democratized on a, on a certain level so that uh, many artists can make a living at it. You know, they can hit the road and they can actually see more of the <laughs> money uh, th that is created and they're not constantly indentured or in debt uh, to, to a label necessarily. So I think it's, it's always been hard to make money, but uh, now more people can make a decent living at it, I think. Okay, just not like super high rock I mean, star. <laughs> yeah, the days of private jets and cocaine, I think, are over. We know that. But, uh, you know, I, I think even that was just all surface anyway. You know, no, nobody, no like rock stars of yore weren't seeing the cash. They were just seeing all the perks. I think that's going to be the most tweeted line from the, uh, <laughs> from the panel so far. So a lot of pressure on you guys I know. We'll to top the Coke and anything private Anything with jets. drugs and cocaine. Let's stay we, on the, we had a jet. Yeah, let's right. stay on the... Uh, <laughs> Jimmy, let's stay on the Coke and private jets. Yeah, yeah, we um, had a jet. We how, had a jet. <laughs> <laughs> how how <laughs> can... Um, I don't know. How can artists start to make more money in this? I mean, because, you know, I think the big fear is people will stop <laughs> making music if it's not financially viable. Um, I think uh, a couple things. So, look in, in the in the in 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 the '90s, you really had to be uh, you had to have an entrepreneurial spirit to make a go in the music business. You had to have uh, a stellar product in order to even have a chance uh, to release a record. Very few bands got signed. Um, there was only a few portals in which you could successfully release and distribute music and market it, and those were the record labels of the time. Um, as the business got more homogenized. Uh, through the late 1990s and into the 2000s, it became easier to create and release music, um, and there was and there was economics still attached to that. But those those became more business plans and less band oriented. And I think what's going on now is you see uh, the inflection point where you know bands uh, will get together, they'll talk about social media strategy, they'll talk about a business mm -hmm. plan, they'll foment uh, 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 a trajectory to a destination that may not be music centric. And I think yeah. now that the I think the good news is that now the econo now that the economics of so and so quote unquote fallen out of the business, you're going to see uh, a resurgence of people who really truly want to create music. Yeah. and I think that's going to give us yeah. the next Bob Dylan. Chris, it seems like the music industry used to be pretty straightforward. You went into a studio, you you cut an album, you sold it to your fans, you went on tour, they bought tickets, and then you went on the private jet and right. stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, whereas now, like you said, you need a social media strategy, you need a merchandising strategy, you, you probably need 
to work with brands. You have to tour probably two thirds of the year, if not more. Is that sort of it that it's just, you just got to do a lot more as an artist now? Yeah, I mean, it really is. It's amazing how little we, as a you know, music publication and thinking about music, t ever talk about record sales. Like, it's almost a complete moot point. We don't look at a band and say, they're selling tons of records. You look at the band first and foremost for quality, and then, yeah, they've got to hustle. Like, it's tour dates. It's, like, I can't even imagine the complexities of the business that is a band at this point. Because, like you were saying, it was a little bit more siphoned off when it was just very simplistic. You had your marching orders, you went on tour, you made money, you had an advance, you sold records, and it was easy. And now it's like, I mean, sometimes people get these ideas where bands are huge and they're living in small apartments in New York and, you know, they're, they're doing their life just like anybody else is. And they happen to have an amazing, they're amazing musicians and tour it, but it's, I'm just so glad to not be in a band uh, <laughs> that it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing to not be playing music because it's a grind. I can't imagine. So, Adrian, yeah, do you can counsel bands just to get out of the business? What's that? Do you counsel <laughs> bands just to get out of the business? Well, Liz, I mean, this... Go to law school. These days, yeah. musicians, yeah, artists, everybody has a default education in business and marketing. You know, we're all online. We get it at, at, to a certain extent. So now it's just, and, and a lot of artists are doing it for themselves, uh, like you said, which is great because it means that th they can empower themselves and they don't need the label to do it for them and then, you know, uh, take all the money. So, so they have a real opportunity to make it by taking on the role of t playing, having many hats. Uh, but what we're do doing at Rec Room is we're trying to bring in a community so that artists can help artists. Yeah. You know, because then that m that marketing can can be can be amortized across everybody, and everybody can help each other. And that's that's really w the way we used to do it back in yeah. the the late '90s, yeah. at least for me. Yeah. Is you know I'd go see my friends' bands, and they'd come see mine, and we'd hand out flyers, and we'd do it for each other. And this is now in a digital age. Yeah, so it seemed like, you know, labels used to be the sort of intermediary that siphoned off arguably more value than they created. And now it's like meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Now we have these huge technology platforms that are acting as intermediaries, and we're starting to see conflicts there. Is that it? I mean, is, is the sort of new, uh, you know, we see Taylor Swift uh, with Spotify, and she pulled her music off Spotify. Is that the start of of more artists sort of fighting back against the power that these platforms are starting to have? Um, I think that's a unique case. I mean, I think, you know, that's simply a numbers game. I think, you know, she, she ran the numbers and make it, made an economic decision um, that may or may not have impacted her career. Um, but again, I think, you know, stamping our feet uh, is not the solution. I think educated artists uh, who have a place at the table, who demand a place at the table when these businesses are being brought together and demand a seat when these platforms are being constructed is the answer because this, this kind of, um, you know, after the fact uh, type of negotiating is what, you know, what happened during the Motown era and it's why artists traditionally ended up getting ripped off throughout the history of recorded music. I mean, it's been that second day, third day place at the table where it's been after the fact negotiating that's gotten artists in trouble in the first place. Artists need to demand a place at the table uh, from the, from the get-go. And I think what, what Adrian's doing is a, is a good example of that, is uh, fomenting a business plan that actually works to support and create a foundation where artists can thrive and curate uh, more and more great art. Yeah. Chris, do you see artists having, are being more or less disenfranchised now versus in the analog era? Um, I would say they're less disenfranchised. I think there's, a, there's an aura of optimism. I mean, we haven't even really even discussed YouTube, but like, there's a really interesting way for, I think the kind of, bands can do a lot or an artist can do a lot with their career and on their own terms more than ever. And that might not mean that you're gonna be as big as Taylor Swift and they don't have the sway that she would have over Spotify, but uh, when you have a, a strong support system around it, whether it be friends or a label or otherwise, I think that there's, an, there's some optimism that you can create a, a level of sustainability, which is key, you know, like no one's out, unlike probably before, people weren't out to go be the biggest band in the world, at least not everyone, but they're out to create art and to create a sustainable life for themselves where they can pay their bills and they can you know, be happy with themselves. And that might seem romantic, but you know, when you see bands on a stage getting stoked playing in front of 5,000 people and then freaking out, uh, they're doing that because they love what they're playing, not because so, they're gonna get some huge amount of money. They're gonna go buy like McDonald's just like anyone else. And okay in a tour bus and it'll be greasy. Okay, you know? so it's like join a band, have roommates into your 30s. Yeah, yeah, just be, yeah, don't grow up. <laughs> uh, Adrian, for, for sort of up and coming artists, who's, who's like an example of someone that you would point them to at, that has really managed their sort of career the right way? Like who do you admire? 
Smashing Pumpkins? <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Uh, Seriously? <laughs> thank you. I, uh, I mean, that's, that's a tough one. I feel like, you know, all the... There, there's so much more to, to be created in using technology and using new media uh, that I think we've only just begun. You know, I, I personally, I'm, I'm always looking for smaller, more intimate experiences, you know, where, where you can get artists in front of people. So, I mean, I, you know, a lot of the experiences that I've had are so small and private that, you know, only I and, like, a group of people would have experienced them. So it's... It's hard to say because once, once artists reach a certain level, they, they become, you know, inaccessible, in my opinion. Yeah. Jimmy, how about you? Um, uh, you know, I think um, I saw Jack White in uh, Chicago uh, a few months ago. And I think, you know, Jack is a good example of kind of the modern trajectory in the modern music business. I think he's done a great uh, global business, but then he's, he's realized a great niche business as well with his vinyl pressing. And I think he's a, he's a very forward-thinking artist. Uh, whether you like his music or not, I'm just strictly talking about his business plan and the way he approaches social media, uh, the way he, uh, 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 the way he um, deals with his fan base, what he delivers to them, his knowledge of his fan base. I mean, I think those things are all critical. I think an artist really has to know um, what, what they're delivering. They need to know what the destination is, and they need to know what their fans, they need to have an intimate relationship with their fans. And I think those tools are out there now to where there's, there's communication uh, back and forth and, and artists can know kind of what, what the tea leaves are saying before they, before they create something. And I was even talking to somebody the other day about, they were asking me, um, what would the kind of modern record company look like? And I said, uh, think of this as a concept. If you could take an artist like David Bowie and you could pull a million David Bowie fans and ask them three things that they would like to see from the next David Bowie record and run an algorithm and hand that to David Bowie and say, Here's what your audience said. You could still be David Bowie, but in the context of these three things, think of what a cool piece of art that would be for somebody like David Bowie to have that type of information and be able to realize, of course, it wouldn't be an exact rep representation of what the people wanted, but artists are looking for a destination. It's really, it's difficult to wake up and just write something out of thin air. Really, you're trying to conceptualize an, a topic or an ideal, and that leads you in a direction of creation. And I think, you know, digital, uh, gives us the opportunity to kind of realize some of those destinations and package them in a way that allow us to be creative, uh, maybe in different ways, but but maybe in in in, in ways that are that are, have to do with more tetherization to our fan base. Chris, how about you? Who's who's an artist that has an innovative strategy? I think I think actually like an artist that, whether or not you like them or not, but it's more of like a collective. The Odd Future Kids, all those kids from uh, California, I think. I mean, I remember following them on Tumblr and mostly just like laughing at their pictures. And I don't think that they were looking at that as a strategy, but they inherently were building a community of fans based on just their personalities and their taste in fashion, their taste in music, the artists that inspire them, you know, through being provocative. But I mean, with Tyler, the creator, I followed him on Twitter when he had like 3,800 people. And now it's like, I remember him freaking out when he got to 5,000. I have no idea what it's at now. I frankly, I think I unfollowed him because it was just too much going on. Uh, but I think what they've done is create kind of like an environment with which they're there for each other, they're there for their friends, and that resonates with people and people see that and they see the excitement that comes from making music. And then, of course, the strategy that they were, you know, unintentionally deploying became a strategy. Okay. We're going to end on the optimistic note, but uh, I want to thank you, Adrian, Jimmy, and Chris. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat>